All right, hey folks, so um, welcome to the first of these sorts of lectures. I can't record on campus anymore, so now you're just gonna see my iPad screen as we go through the lectures. So let's give this a go. Uh, right, so this week we're gonna be talking about determinants, and so let's get into it. Let's learn what a determinant is, what the point of it is, how to compute it, that sort of stuff. So we're gonna start off with sort of what the point of a determinant is, what it says geometrically. Okay. And so the idea behind it is it's sort of a measure of how large uh, a matrix is. Okay, If you think of the matrix as a linear transformation, so it's moving vectors around, it measures basically how much it expands space. Okay, So let's draw a little picture here just to remind us ourselves of some of these things. So I'm thinking of my matrix as a linear transformation, and I'm going to draw it sort of just acting on R2 here, so on two-dimensional space. And so here's what it's going to do. My matrix, you know... Uh, call it A, it sends two-dimensional space from the left over to the right here. I'm going to draw sort of this grid type of picture that we've drawn once or twice before. So remember what your matrix does is it sends the standard basis vectors E1 and E2, uh, and it just sends them somewhere, but then because of that, what it does is it sends sort of the unit square grid on the left over to just some parallelogram grid on the right. All right, so it does something like this. If this is E1 and this is E2, then we've got like T of E1, or sorry, A times E1, A times E1, and A times E2 over here. All right, and then we just sort of overlay a parallelogram grid on top of this, okay? So here's my square grid on the left, just a unit square grid. So I'm just gonna draw squares with side lengths of one everywhere on this grid over here. And then over here on the right, it's just a parallelogram that's determined by these two vectors, AE1 and AE2. So you just copy these lines sort of parallel at a distance that's determined by the length of these vectors. Okay, so something like that. All right. And what happens here is the determinant. The determinant is a measure of how much space is expanded when you apply the matrix like this. So what it does is, well, if we focus on just one of these squares, and we might as well focus on that one that's sort of closest to the origin, the one that has E1 and E2 as its sides, it answers the question of how much bigger does that square get when we apply this uh, linear transformation, this matrix A to it. So in other words, the determinant, it's exactly the area of this parallelogram over here. So what we call the determinant of A is this. It's whatever that area is. So in other words, the determinant of a matrix, and just for the sake of notation, we denote it by det of A, that means determinant of A. Well, what the determinant is, is it's the ratio of how big is the output space versus how big is the input space. All right? So in other words, determinant of A is, well, it's either area or volume or hypervolume, depending on what the dimension is. But sort of in general, it's, uh, it's like it's the volume of output parallelogram, or parallel pipe it, I guess, if we were in 3D, divided by, well, the same volume, but of the input. No, input parallel pipe it. Okay, and I mean, like in, in this picture that we drew up here, it was just 2D, so the parallelopipeds are parallelograms and volumes are areas. But I mean, just in general, like if it's a two by two matrix, it's gonna be areas you're talking about. If it's a three by three matrix, it's gonna be volumes you're talking about because now it acts on three dimensional space. If it's a four by four matrix, now it's gonna be hyper volumes and hyper parallelopipeds because now it's acting on four dimensional space and so on. But it's sort of just whatever the output volume or area or whatever is divided by the corresponding input thing. Okay, and then this picture that we drew up here, the sort of the input area that we drew over on the left, that input square, that just has area one. So when we divide by it, it doesn't do anything. So the determinant is just the area of the, the parallelogram on the right. All right. And so our goal for this week is to try to figure out what sort of properties the determinant should have and also how to actually compute it. 
Okay, so that's where we're going with this. Let's, and so it's going to turn out that the determinants, there are a bunch of different ways of computing it, but basically every single one of them is going to be rather nasty. Okay, there are a bunch of explicit formulas even, but they're all really, really hideous and take a while to get used to. So we're going to start off instead looking at what the basic properties of the determinant are, because the properties that satisfies are actually quite nice. Okay, it's fairly intuitive if you think about it geometrically, but if you try to just jump straight into the formulas, you know, your head's going to explode a little bit. All right, so let's start off looking at the basic properties that it has. First off, if we think about what uh, the determinant of the identity matrix should be, remember the identity matrix, it doesn't stretch or expand or shrink or do anything to space, right? It just leaves everything alone. So the determinant of the identity matrix should be pause for dramatic effect, it should be one, right? Because, well, what is the ratio of the output output area to the input area? Well, it's just gonna be one, they're the exact same. The identity matrix doesn't change anything. So how much does it stretch space by? Well, a factor of one, all right? So determinant of the identity matrix should be one. All right, and then a couple other properties that we'll need. Well, the next one is, well, think about what happens if you do two linear transformations in a row. In other words, what happens if you multiply matrices? That's what we're going to answer next. It's, so, sorry about that. Is if we multiply two matrices, if we want to compute determinant of A times B, well, think about this geometrically. What this means is I'm applying two linear transformations one after another. I'm applying B and then I'm applying A. Okay, and what this does is okay, space is stretched first by however much B stretches space. So, in other words, I stretch space by a factor of determine to B. Okay, and then after that, I apply the linear transformation A, which is going to stretch space by a factor of A, of, sorry, by a factor of determinant of A. So space overall, it's stretched by however much B stretches space, and then by however much A stretches space. So the determinant of AB is just going to be the determinant of A times the determinant of B. It's just the product of those two individual determinants because it's just you're stretching space once and then you're stretching it again. So what's the overall stretch factor? Well, just the product of the original stretch factors. And this is called multiplicativity of the determinant. All right, and then last up, we're gonna need one more property of the determinant before we can get running with things like computing it, okay? So the last thing that we need to know is what happens if I just change one column of a matrix, okay? So for example, what happens to the determinant of a matrix if I multiply one of its columns by some scalar? Not the whole matrix by that scalar, but just one of its columns. All right, and again, I'm gonna think about this geometrically to try to figure out what's gonna happen here. So actually, you know what? Maybe I'm just gonna copy down my paper, my picture from this uh, previous page. Just copy this down, and I'm gonna make some tweaks to it. All right, so uh, let's see. I'm gonna need to clean up this sort of output picture a little bit here. All right, you know what? Maybe I'll just redo my grid. All right, and we're going to ask, okay, what does A do to this output grid? But also, what, what, is it, what does it do if instead I multiply one of its columns by some scalar? All right, so here, let's see, here's the output parallelogram. Again, so this is what A does. Same thing that I did on the previous page. All right, and again, shade that in. All right, so that's what A does. And actually, because I'm going to have two different matrices here, I'm going to color code them. So that green output uh, grid, that's what A does. So I'm going to write A in green here. All right, so that's what A does. But now, what if I were to multiply, let's say, the second column of A by one half? Okay, so if I write A in terms of its columns, so I mean, its first column is A1, and then its second column is A2. Okay, it's a two by two matrix, so it has two columns. Well, what if I defined a new matrix, let's call it B, which has the same first column as A, but second column is only half as large as the second column of A. Okay, so I've multiplied one of the columns of A by a half. 
What happens to this output parallelogram grid? Well, if you think about our matrix multiplication, think back to all, to all of our linear transformation rules and everything, this matrix B, it sends E1 to the exact same space, exact same spot that A sent E1, right? They both send E1, the first standard basis vector, to their first column. And since they have the first same the same first column, they both send E1 to A1. All right, so that vector is not going to change. So sort of one direction of the parallelogram grid isn't changing here. Okay, but then, oops. But then what happens is, whereas A sent E2 to A2, okay, sort of the vertical side of the output parallelogram, B is going to send E2 to one half A2. So B is going to send... E2 to this vector that just points up one half as far as A2 itself. All right, so it just gets sent there. So this is what B does. It's going to sort of have the same vertical-ish sides of the output parallelogram grid. Okay, but the more horizontal sides of that parallelogram grid, well, they're going to come twice as often, right? Because now we're going to have a side right here on the output parallelogram grid, and also in between here, and also in between here, and so on. But also, like, those green lines themselves, those are also red, right? There's twice as many lines on the red grid as there were on the green grid. All right, so in terms of like output areas and determinants and whatnot, the output parallelogram grid for B is just this bottom half of the output parallelogram for A. And in particular, that means it's exactly half as large, right? It's exactly as wide, but only half as tall. So what this tells us is that determinants of B in this particular case equals, well, it's just one half times the determinants of A. And more generally, what happens here is what you might just expect based on this. I mean, we've just shown what happens in the two-dimensional case and in the case when the scalar is one half here. But in general, what you get if you multiply one of the scalars, or sorry, one of the columns of a matrix by a particular scalar, well, that multiplies the determinant by that scalar. So let's see, in general, determinant of, let's say, you know, a matrix listed according to its columns, well, if you multiply one of those columns by a scalar, then what happens is that scalar can just be pulled right out in front. So you just get C times that determinant. So determinant of, you know, the matrix with A1 as its first column and AJ as its Jth column over to AN as its last column. All right, and this is this is a little weird. Like this is very unlike most other matrix functions that we've seen up to this point. So please take a second to try to get used to this, right? We're used to that if you multiply some object by a scalar, you can pull that scalar out of the entire thing, right? This is a property of linear transformations. They can pull scalars out of the entire object, okay? But here it's you're pulling scalars out of just one of the columns. So this is part of a property that we call multilinearity. It's sort of the matrix. The, the the determinant is linear in each of the columns of the matrix not in the matrix as a whole. It's not linear, it's multilinear. It's sort of a more complicated ver version of linearity. All right, and then similarly, well, I mean, if we're talking about linearity, it makes sense to ask not just what happens when we multiply by a scalar, but what happens if we add another vector to one of those columns, right? So what happens if we take two matrices, uh, or sorry, what happens if we take a matrix and then just add a column, uh, some other vector to one of its columns? Okay, so we're not adding two matrices, we're just adding something to one of the columns of a matrix. What happens then? Okay, and this is a little bit harder to draw, so I'm going to cheat a little bit here. I'm just going to paste something in to try to give an idea. Oh, that's right, I, I copied that. All right, give me a second here. I've got to copy and paste something in, because this is harder to draw, and I'm going to screw it up if I try to actually do it by hand. Okay. All right, 
So what I've drawn here, or what you know, a computer has drawn for me, is sort of three different matrices, okay? On the left is our standard input picture. That's just, you know, over on the left here. This is R2, and I've just sort of highlighted our usual uh, input square grid that's, uh, you know, de determined by E1 and E2. And then I've applied three matrices uh, to this input grid, okay? The first one is A1, V1, next one's A1, W, next one's A1, V plus W, okay? So there's three matrices that have the same first column, but in the third matrix, um, the second column is the sum of the second columns of the other two matrices, okay? So the idea here is, is that we're taking two matrices and we're just adding up the second columns of those two matrices and to get another matrix, all right? And when you do this, Okay, this is a little bit hard to picture, so I apologize, but what happens is your first matrix, okay, so the parallelogram grid that I've drawn on the right here just corresponds to this parallelogram, which comes from the first matrix, all right? Whereas the second matrix, I mean, it has the same base vector. It has the same bottom, A1, okay? So I've drawn this A1 parallel to this A1 down here. All right, but the second column where E2 gets sent, that can be different. So V, the second column of A1, can be very different from W, the second column of A2. So that's why those are, there's no relation between those two vectors in general. They just point in different ways. All right, so that's why for, for the second matrix here, we get this as our output parallelogram, parallelogram, that one that was highlighted in green. All right, but then when you add up those second columns to get this third matrix, the one that's in orange here, A1, but then the second column is V plus W, for this one, okay, again, the base of the parallelogram is the same. It's just this A1 side vector down here. But then the other side of the parallelogram is the sum of V plus W. It's this big long side up here. All right, and what, what hopefully seems sort of believable from this picture is that, well, if you were to add up the areas of this blue parallelogram and the area of the green parallelogram, you would get the exact same quantity as, well, it's just the area of this orange parallelogram here, okay? And why is that? Well, I mean, if you, if you look at the area defined by the blue and green parallelograms and just sort of imagine chopping this triangle up from the right and plopping it in over on this hole on the left. If you just sort of unbow out uh, this shape here from bending over to the right and just sort of squish it back over here to the left, you would just get exactly that orange par parallelogram. The blue and orange parallelograms together, they're just sort of a, a, it's the exact same as that orange parallelogram. It's just sort of been punched from the left to make it bow out over this way, All right? So the blue plus the green areas well, that's exactly the same as the orange area, all right? So the point here is that the determinant, if you were to add up those two, first two determinants, you get exactly the third one, determinant of A1V plus the determinant of A1W. Well, that just equals exactly the determinant of A1V plus W. All right, and again, this is sort of a multilinearity thing instead of a linearity thing. This is different than properties that we've seen earlier in the course. This is not something you would see with a linear transformation, right? Here we're saying if you add up matrices that have the same first column but a different second column, well, determinants basically follow through that. Like the determinants just add up as well, okay? But you're only adding one column at a time and to make the determinant add. It's not additive if you do like determinant of an entire matrix plus another entire matrix. It's not linear, it's multilinear. It's linear in the columns of the matrix. All right, so let's put all this together. We finally established the three properties of a determinant that we need to really be able to compute it and work with it. So let's state this all a little bit more formally now, okay? so. Here we go, here's the big hefty definition of a determinant. The determinant of a matrix, well, it's a function that sends, so it's a, determ a function that's denoted by debt, just like we have been up until now, and it sends matrices to real numbers, right? Because, I mean, the determinant, it takes in a matrix and it spits out a real number. It tells you what the size of some matrix is, basically, okay? And, well, it turns out that it's the function that satisfies these upcoming three properties, these properties we've already talked about, but furthermore, actually, it's kind of a remarkable fact that it's the unique function that satisfies these properties. There's only one function out there that satisfies these properties, and it's the determinant. All right, so what are the properties that satisfies? Well, first off, the determinant of the identity matrix has to be one. We talked about that. The identity matrix doesn't stretch or shrink anything. So yeah, determinant is one. 
All right, and it's multiplicative. Determinant of a product is products of the determinant. Okay, again, we talked about why that is. Think of them as linear transformations, stretching space one after another. All right, and then finally, the third property is multilinearity, and it tells us that if you just add things and do linear combinations in one of the columns of a matrix, then everything splits up how you would expect. Okay, you can just split up that linear combination outside of the determinant. So it's kind of like linearity with linear transformations, but it's only one column at a time. All of the other columns of the matrices that you're working with have to be the exact same. You're not doing linear combinations in those columns. So you're not doing linear combinations for matrices as a whole, just one column at a time. All right, so let's get to some actual examples. There are some matrices that we can just use these basic properties to compute the determinant of now. So let's see how that works. Let's compute the determinant of a diagonal matrix to start because those are sort of the easiest ones. All right, so let's compute the determinant of the matrix that just has diagonal entries two and three. All right, so determinant of two, zero, zero, three. What is this? Well, we're just gonna use these three basic properties from up above, okay? And in particular, I'm gonna focus on property C, which tells me I can do linear combinations with one column at a time, basically. And so to start, I'm gonna focus on the first column here. Okay, I'm gonna notice that, hey, Actually, sorry, maybe before I get to that, sort of my end goal here is the only matrix so far whose determinant I know how to compute, that's the identity matrix. That's the only matrix whose determinant I know how to compute. So I wanna get there. I wanna reduce this matrix A down to the identity matrix somehow. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna simplify each of these columns via linear combinations enough until they look like the columns of the identity matrix. So this first column here, well, I can just multiply it by a half. But if I multiply that column by half, then I sort of think of it as like pulling the two out of the out of that second column, right? It, the determinant is linear in the columns of a matrix. All right, so what's gonna happen here is I can pull a two out of that determinant if I, if I multiply that first column by a half, All right? So what I did here is I used multilinearity. Multi I used property C. All right, so it's just like linear transformations, except only one column at a time. I didn't, I didn't pull a two out of the entire matrix. I only pulled a two out of that first column. All right, but now I can do the exact same thing with the second column. I want to turn it into the identity matrix, so I'm going to pull a three out of that second column, which turns the two out in front into a six. All right, and again, what I did there was I used multilinearity. I used property C of determinants. All right, and now finally, well, this is six times the determinant of the identity matrix, and property A tells me the identity matrix has determinant one, so that overall determinant is just six. All right, so here I'm using property A of determinants. All right, and then I'm done. So the determinant of that diagonal matrix with two and three on its diagonal, well, that's just six. All right. Let's start looking at you know, a couple more general properties of determinants that are gonna help us uh, compute it for more a wider class of matrices rather than just diagonal matrices. All right? And the first thing that we're gonna look at now is, well, what if your matrix is invertible versus not invertible? What does the determinant tell you in those cases? All right, and well, the thing to notice is that if your matrix is invertible, what's that tell you? Well, if your matrix is invertible, that means that uh, a times A inverse is the identity matrix, right? You can find some matrix A inverse, such that when you multiply by A, you get the identity matrix. All right, well, let's just slap a determinant on both sides of that equation, All right? So if I equals A A inverse, what's that tell us? Uh, I'll stop zooming, there we go. That tells us that determinant of the identity matrix equals the determinant of A A inverse all right, and now, well, we know how to simplify both sides of this equation a little bit. Over on the left here, determinant of the identity matrix, that's just one, right? That's property A again. All right, this is property A. And over on the right here, determinant of A times A inverse, well, we're gonna use multi uh, multiplicativity now. This is property B. We can split this up as determinant of A times determinant of A inverse. All right, so this is property B. All right, 
And now let's just rearrange this. We have one equals determinant of A times determinant of A inverse. So let's simplify a little bit. In particular, this tells us that determinant of A inverse, it's got to equal one divided by determinant of A, right? Just divide that entire equation through by determinant of A to get this. All right, so the determinant of an in, the inverse of a matrix is just one divided by the determinant of the original matrix. All right, and furthermore, in order for this to actually make sense, right? Let, let, let's look at this equation directly above. It says one equals the determinant of A times the determinant of A inverse. The only way that's actually possible is if the determinant of A, if the determinant of A does not equal zero. All right, right, because if determinant of A was zero, if determinant of A equaled zero, then this entire product would equal zero and all of this would equal zero and you'd have zero equals one, that can't happen. Okay, so the determinant of A must not be zero. All right, and so this tells us if the matrix is invertible, its determinant is not zero. Okay, it turns out, we're gonna get back to this, we're gonna show that actually this is a complete, complete characterization of invertibility. We're gonna show that the converse is true. If the determinant, um, if the matrix is not invertible, then the determinant equals zero, okay? So it goes both ways. Determinant not equaling zero is equivalent to being invertible. All right, but we'll get to that. For now, let's think about this formula sort of geometrically. Like, what does this mean? Determinant of A inverse equals one over determinant of A. Let's think about it geometrically. And again, I'm just gonna copy down that original uh, picture that I drew. Right, so just copy down this uh, sort of geometric picture of matrices and linear transformations again. All right, now. All right, well, remember like your matrix A, it's turning space from the left here over onto the right and so the determinant of that matrix, it's uh, determinant of A is area of output divided by area of input. All right. And now actually, so I'm gonna sort of note which area is the input and which is the output, okay? So I'm, with A, I'm thinking of star over on the left there, that's my input area, and then dagger over here on the right, that's my output area, okay? And the reason that's important to highlight which one is which, because now I'm gonna think about, well, what's A inverse doing? A inverse, remember, it's just the matrix that undoes what A does. So A inverse, if you think of it as a linear transformation, it just takes the picture over on the right and makes it look like the picture over on the left. It undoes what A does. All right, so, well then, what would determinant of A inverse be? Well, now, it's the, it's the area of the input to A inverse, div or sorry, it's the in area of the output of A inverse divided by the area of the output, or sorry, divided by the area of the input of A inverse except the inputs and outputs have swapped, okay? So it's the area of the output of A inverse though. What is the output of A inverse? Well, the output of A inverse is the stuff over on the left here. It's the star divided by the area of the input of A inverse. And what is that? Well, the input of A inverse is this picture over on the right. It's the picture with the dagger, all right? So the point is, like this is just the like this fraction over here on the right is just the reciprocal of this fraction over on the left. Okay, so the determinant of A inverse, yeah, it's just gonna be one divided by the determinant of A. Okay, so that's what happens if the matrix is invertible. On the other hand, if A is not invertible, then what happens? And again, I'm just gonna try, draw a picture here to try to convince you, all right? So again, I'm just gonna copy down, so I'm just gonna copy down the left half of this first picture that we did this time. All right, but this time our matrix is not invertible. And again, let's think about well, what does that mean geometrically? If your matrix is not invertible, 
Remember, we've talked about this once or twice. If your matrix is not inverbal, that means the range of the matrix is not all of Rn. It means it's squishing a uh, space, which is two dimensional in this case, it's squishing R2 down onto some smaller subspace. Okay, so it's switch it, squishing it down to just a zero vector or a line. Okay, so I'm gonna draw it here as if it's squishing space down onto some line. All right, because if your matrix is not invertible, that's what's happening. It's squishing space down onto a smaller dimensional subspace. The output is not all of two dimensional space. It's some one dimensional or zero dimensional subspace. All right, so here, this is the range of A, some line. All right, and now remember what the determinant is asking. It's asking what is the area of the output space divided by the area of the input space. So uh, over here, I've already got on the left, I've already highlighted sort of the input uh, square. On the right, I should highlight what is the uh, what is the output parallelogram. And it's sort of a degenerate parallelogram this time because what's happening is while E1 is being sent somewhere here and then E2 is being sent somewhere on the exact same line. So the input parallelogram, it's just, well, you add up those two vectors and that gives you the long diagonal of this parallelogram. It's just that, it's just a line segment. Okay, it's just a chunk of that line. Okay, that's the output parallelogram. Okay, so determinants of A, equals the area of the output divided by the area of the input. Okay, and if we use these, like sort of the highlighted yellow regions here as our input and output, while well, the input is this square over on the left here, it has area one. Fine, the denominator is one, no problem. Over here on the right though, the output parallelogram is actually a line segment now, and the area of a line segment is zero, right? It doesn't have area. What we're doing here in general, in the n-dimensional case, we're asking what is the n-dimensional volume of some shape that lives within n minus one or fewer dimensions, right? And this is always, always, always gonna be zero. Okay, like the area of a line segment, zero. What is the volume of a parallelogram? zero. What is the hypervolume of a cube? Well, zero, right? I mean, you're always asking like sort of for an n-dimensional volume of an n minus one or smaller dimensional shape. That's always going to be zero, right? So if your matrix is not invertible, this determinant, this ratio here just ends up being zero because you're asking for the area of a smaller dimensional shape. All right. So if you put together these observations that we've made, we get this following theorem. Theorem 9.1, it just tells you that if you have any, um, I don't know why I have two matrices here. Suppose that you have just one matrix A, we don't need a matrix B there. Suppose you've got a matrix A, then A is invertible if and only if the determinant of that matrix does not equal zero. And furthermore, if that matrix is invertible, then the determinant of the inverse, we have a nice formula for it. The determinant of the inverse is just one divided by the determinant of the original matrix. All right, so this is nice. It gives us, gives us yet another characterization of invertibility of a matrix. Okay, remember we've all already seen tons of characterizations in terms of like the columns spanning all of Rn, uh, the rows being linearly independent, uh, of, I don't know, the rank of the matrix being n, the nullity being zero, uh, the linear system Ax equals b always having a solution and so on. Like all of these things are equivalent to invertibility and now we've got yet another equivalent thing to invertibility. All right. Whew. All right, so just a couple other quick properties of the determinant to round out today's lecture. Suppose that you've got some matrix A, doesn't matter what it is, and some scalar, again, does not matter what it is. Then let's just ask the let's answer the question of what happens to the determinant when we do two different things. So first off, if you take the transpose of a matrix, determinant does not change. The determinant of A always equals the determinant of A transpose. Unfortunately, this is one of the few properties of the determinant that I do not have a nice geometric interpretation of, okay? We're not gonna prove this theorem in class. Um, we're not gonna prove part B here in class. Um, I don't have a nice geometric interpretation of it. It's just one of those things that when you get to all of the various formulas of the determinant that we're gonna see, this will pop out of them, okay? So it's not too hard to prove once you have formulas, but I don't have a nice geometric interpretation of it. Part A here though, answers the question of what happens if you take the entire matrix and multiply it by a scalar, okay? And this does have a nice geometric interpretation. What happens is the determinant, well, it's gonna get bigger, it's gonna get multiplied by 
c to the power n, okay? And this maybe feels a little weird at first, but remember the determinant, it's not linear, it's multilinear. So the way to think about this is if you multiply a by some scalar c, what you're doing is you're multiplying every single one of a's columns by that scalar c. And how many columns does a have? Well, it has n columns, all right? So you're multiplying the first column of a by c and the second column of a by c and so on. You're, you're doing a multiplication by c n times. So you get a factor of c to the power n being pulled out, right? This, or another way of thinking, well, I mean, the same way of thinking about it really is, like if you go back to this picture here, this is the picture that we had for when you multiply just a single column by a scalar. Well, that, that decreased the size of the output parallelogram by, or sorry, it multiplied the area of that output par parallelogram by whatever that scalar was, because you sort of scaled it in that one direction. Well, if you multiply the entire matrix by C, now you're scaling it in every single direction. You're scaling it in this direction the, when you multiply by the second column. You're scaling it in this direction when you multiply it by the first column, and so on. So however many dimensions you have, however many directions you have, that determines the exponent on C. That determines how many times you multiply by C. So that's why it's C to the power N, not just C. All right. So let's do a couple examples to make use of these properties as well. Suppose that we have two matrices for which we know the determinant. We know the determinant of A is two and we know the determinant of B is five. And we're gonna use that information to compute the determinants of some other matrices. So let's just make up some junk here. So how about something like A squared times B times A inverse. If we know the determinants of A and B, well, we've seen enough at this point that we can figure out what this determinant equals, what the de determinant of a squared ba inverse is, okay? And the trick here is make use of multiplicativity, make use of the rule that we saw for inverses, and so on, okay? So here, we can split this up as determinant of a squared times determinant of b times determinant of a inverse. Great, all right? Now we can su start subbing things in. Determinant of b, Ah, cool, I know what that is. That's five, that's just given in the question, right? Determinant of B is five. All right. So I'm gonna plug in a five for determinant of B there. Now, determinant of A squared, I don't quite know what that is yet, but there's a trick. Just remember what A squared means. A squared just means A times A. So this is determinant of A times A, and then times determinant of A inverse. And I'll simplify that in the next step, maybe. All right. Let's go one step further. Determinant of A times A. Great, I know how to deal with that. That's a product of two matrices. Split it up, use multiplicativity. That's determinant of A times determinant of A times determinant of A inverse. All right, and now I'm golden, okay? The thing that I'm gonna note now is that determinant of A times determinant of A inverse, well, that's gonna be one, right? Remember, determinant of A inverse uh, is one over determinant of A. So this, these two terms over on the right here, you multiply those together, you just get one. Determinant of A, well that's given in the question, determinant of A is two. All right, so all you get at the end of the day is five times two times one, you get 10. All right. I want to do one more example just because there are a couple other properties of determinants that we know at this point, but we, we didn't see in that previous example. So just one more quick example. What if you do determinant of, let's say two times A transpose B. All right, now be a little bit careful here. This really trips people up. It's really tempting to pull that two out in front of the determinant, but you don't pull out a two. We have to use this property up here. If you have a scalar inside of a determinant, it gets pulled out with an exponent of whatever the size of the matrix is. So when we pull that two out in front, it becomes a two to the power of three because the matrices are three by three. It gets pulled out as two to the power of three, which is eight. Right, and now we can use multiplicativity. We have an A transpose B. Well, that just splits up as determinant of A transpose times determinant of B. And now we can plop everything in. Determinant of A transpose. Ah, 
Well, our previous theorem tells us that the determinant does not change when you take the transpose. Determinant of A transpose is just determinant of A. Great. All right, so we can just plop everything in here. We've got two to the power three, which is eight, times determinant of A transpose, which is determinant of A, which is two, and then times determinant of B, which is five. Okay, and that, so that just equals eight times 10, which is 80, right? Alrighty, so that's enough for today. We've learned all of the basic properties of the determinant that we're going to need. So next class, we're going to go on to, well, how do you actually compute the determinant in general outside of sort of special cases like the identity matrix and diagonal matrices? How do you compute it just for general matrices? So that's the goal of next class. I will talk to you all then.